here we go. All right, well, welcome everyone to the June Speakers Night. Um, we have a, uh, Rob, you're going to let people in, right? We have a talk tonight by Dr. Ryan <coughs> McKinden. Oh, I got it. Uh, who will be introduced later, but uh, he'll be talking about fast radio bursts and the uh, Chime radio facility. So uh, before we begin, I have a couple of announcements I'd like to make. Um, <clears throat> this Sunday, uh, the RESC National is holding the annual general meeting from 1 p.m. till 4.45. Registration's free to all members. Uh, there is a link I will put in the uh, chat window if you haven't already uh, registered for it. Um, there are two items of note. Um, the first is that they will be presenting the current financials for National. Uh, and uh, there's a very important vote for new board members. And our president, Randy Atwood, is standing for election. Uh, so your votes would be very much appreciated. Randy, as many of you know, Randy stepped in uh, to uh, try and put things back together after the uh, recent turmoil and uh, did a wonderful job, of course. Um, but um, it would be great if you could uh, get on and vote. I'll give times later. If you could get on and vote um, to get him in there, he, his plan is to act as a liaison between the national office and the board. Part of the problem last, over the last couple of few years has been a breakdown in communication. And Randy having served all over the place, he's been involved with the RESC for all of his uh, life, I think almost, um, uh, and knows it very well. Um, he'll be invaluable in making that connection. And improve yet. The so as I said, it goes from one to four forty-five. The financials are presented about three thirty. So if you need to just come in late and and you're interested in the financials, uh, I I think it's a good idea. You'll see that they've they're on the road now to a, a far more stable situation, uh, and the voting for board members will be after that. Um, the second item I'd like to mention is that this coming Tuesday from 9 till 10.30, uh, weather provided, uh, we have a Riverwood Public Star Party. Uh, registration is required on the um, Riverwood website, but if you, it, but it's already full. So if you simply show up, um, you can pay $5 a person at the gate and get in. Uh, normally, RESC members get in free, but uh, if you haven't, you have to register for these things about four months in advance now, I think. Um, uh, alternatively, if you have a telescope and would like to let us know you're coming, uh, you can show up about half an hour early, at least half an hour early, and drive right through to the back where we um, hold the um, sessions and uh, share views uh, through your telescope with the public. It's generally a pretty good turnout. And uh, last time, I think we had 18 telescopes. Um, but uh, if, you, if you can make it, uh, weather provided, we do have a Wednesday fallback, okay? Um, so that is it for um, announcements now. I'd like to turn the meeting over now to Chris Malicki, the chair of the awards committee for an award presentation. Over to you, Chris. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan. The Mississauga Centre has established five awards. Not every award is given out each year. This year, the Centre is giving out two awards. The Special Project Award has already been presented to Rob Neal at our picnic on June 10th. The second award to be presented this year is the Centre Award. The recipient was not present at the picnic, but he is present today. As the chair of the awards committee, I am pleased to announce that the center award for 2023 is given to Dr. Ulrich Krull. The center award is an award given to a member of the center who has initiated, developed and run programs to benefit the center membership, has shared his or her expertise in presentations on numerous occasions 
at potpourri meetings or has gone out of his or her way to foster a sense of belonging by encouraging involvement of other center members in the activities of the center. So now, um, if I can share my screen, um, can I do that, Alan, or? Um, okay, so um, is, is my screen being shared? Okay. The Center Award, Dr. Ulrich Krull, 2023. Dr. Krull has been the Center's honorary president since 2021. Dr. Ulrich Krull is the former principal and vice president of University of Toronto, Mississauga. He has been a friend to and supporter of the Mississauga Center for many years. Dr. Krull attended his first, the first Mississauga Astronomical Society meeting in April, 2003 when he officially welcomed us to UTM. He became a Mississauga Center member in 2009. The Mississauga Center is fortunate to have Dr. Kroll as a member. He regularly attends the Center's council meetings, offering excellent insight and advice, and he regularly contributes beautiful astrophotos and interesting articles to Messenger, the Center's newsletter. As we were coming out of COVID and looking to start up in-person meetings again, UTM wished to start wish to start charging us a few hundred dollars per meeting for use of a classroom, which we cannot afford. Thanks to Dr. Krull's involvement and passion for building relationships, the Mississauga Center is now considered part of UTM's Department of Chemical and Physical Sciences, meaning we are able to continue to use a classroom for our meetings without charge. It is for this reason, these reasons that Dr. Ulrich Krull is awarded the Central Award for 2003. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Crow. Am, am I allowed to say something? <laughs> uh, yes, please. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I hope that you can hear me too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would never, ever expect this. And, you know, I'm part of the family. I, I've been part of this family for decades. <laughs> I would never expect something like that. You know, it, it's just wonderful to be with you. And, uh, you know, I'll keep on doing the best I can to keep us moving forward. So it's very, very kind of you to, to you know, pick me out and just, you know, say this. But uh, I, I'm just completely surprised. I, I mean, wow. Thank you so much. Very, very kind of you. But as I say... It the awards committee, the awards committee um, picked you after you were nominated. I won't say who the nominators were, but it is my pleasure as the chair of the committee to be able to mention it to you. And we have a plaque for you as well, Dr. Krull. It's very, very, very kind. And for what it's worth, you call me Dr. Krull. I'm just Uli. <laughs> yeah, Uli. Okay, Uli, we have a plaque for you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Very, okay. very kind. Very thank congratulations. You. Thank you, Willie. Great. Congratulations. I think Betty has a uh, picture of the plaque, which was at the picnic. It made <laughs> me to the picnic. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Wow. Betty, do you have a picture of the plaque or no? That's okay. I do, and I'm I'm ready to share. Okay. Chris, if you could, there we go. I'd share, share. Yeah, I, I can't find my own share video. Sorry, I, I'm stuck here. Oh, gosh. There we go. Yes. Can, can you see uh, it? I can see it. There's a view options at the top of the screen for people that if Chris still. I'm trying to unshare. I, I can see it, the award. I mean, I think everybody can see it, can't we? Oh, okay. oh good. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Sarah. Okay. I still see Chris. Oh. <laughs> You're not going to do, I'm, I'm going to um, log off, uh, Zoom and log in again. Well, I'm seeing the award on one screen and Chris on the other. Okay, Chris's thing is gone. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Yep. Just Thank flowers. You. Just flowers. Oh. 
Well, th thank you, Benny, and congratulations, Uli, on your- Now we can see it. There oh. we go. Oh. <laughs> now it's gone, but we saw it for 10 seconds. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I was done. That's why I took it away. <laughs> okay, it was only on speaker view. Ah. Okay. Oh. Do we okay. want to see it again? Do a quick share. share. That's faster. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much again, Betty, and and again, congratulations, Uli. And we'll we'll get this to you, Uli, with your certificate. I would now like to pass the uh, baton over to Swapna to introduce our speaker. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ryan McKinnavan, uh, uh, who completed his PhD at the University of Toronto and is now a postdoctoral research, a researcher at McGill University. He works within the CHIME FRB collaboration on the detection and analysis of fast radio bursts, uh, specializing on the analysis of polarized signals of FRB sources and helping overseas oversee the daily operations of the instrument. Um, his talk today specifically uh, is on the mystery of fast radio bursts. So we'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. McKinnavan. Uh, I would also uh, like uh, for you to post the questions in the chat. We will address the questions at the end of Dr. McKinnavan's uh, talk today. Uh, and so if you can post your questions on the chat as we go, uh, we'll make sure that all the questions are answered at the end of the session today. With that, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, let me just set my timer here so I get a reminder halfway through my presentation that I'm going way, way too long. Um, so yeah, um, I was happy to receive the invitation to talk about uh, Chime and particularly the CHIME FRB experiment. Um, this is my first time doing a, a, a public talk on the entire uh, CHIME FRB experiment and not my narrow area of interest, which is the polarized properties of, of FRBs. Um, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but um, yeah, as you can see in the back of this, uh, the backdrop to this, this slide here is a, a picture of, of, of CHIME um, taken by one of the software developers um, I was just mentioning the preamble uh, when I joined the call that uh, we have the luxury of having a software developer on China that is also a pretty accomplished amateur photographer, which is always nice in a large collaboration um, for press releases and, and whatnot. So jumping into FRBs, um, FRBs have been uh, a known area, uh, I guess, of interest, a mysterious object for over 15 years or so now. Um, they continue to be a mysterious object despite uh, a large number of ongoing surveys that are dedicated to their uh, their observation. And this is just uh, uh, showing a handful of um, covers of different publications, uh, primarily Nature and Science, um, where they're um, showcased uh, uh, on, the, on the covers. So before I jump into uh, fast radio bursts, um, it might be worth uh, briefly discussing um, radio radio astronomy uh, to a, a, an audience that is, I would imagine, primarily concerned with uh, with with optical. Um, so, uh, if there are members that are like my my dad in the audience, uh, when I go home to visit my dad, often his first question is, uh, "Did you hear any more FRBs?" Um, and I think this is largely due to uh, the fact of this device, uh, the radio, uh, which makes us think that um, radio emission is something that that is heard. Um, and I don't think uh, um, Jody Foster did, uh, you know, help that misconception uh, in in the uh, movie adaptation of of Carl of um, Carl Sagan's uh, uh, sci-fi book Contact. Um, so no, I'm not hearing for. Uh, mis mysterious alien uh, signals. Uh, FRBs are very likely astronomical, and um, they are indeed uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in particular, radio emission is at the uh, far range, the low energy range of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
Um, so obviously everyone here is familiar with optical light, uh, which spans a very narrow range of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, radio emission um, that we observe with time is um, around on the order of uh, meter uh, wavelengths. Uh, and um, on those on those wavelengths, um, it's beneficial for, for to go for radio astronomy because we don't suffer from um, um, atmospheric opacity. Um, and what that allows us to do is build large uh, instruments in the radio uh, domain uh, dedicated to their observation. Uh, so we can build large terrestrial uh, telescopes um, and we don't have to, uh, unlike uh, observing at higher frequencies where we have to send up um, detectors um, into outer space, um, we can build massive um, parabolic dishes dedicated to their observation of, of radio emissions. So uh, a couple examples here are shown on the right, a screen Green Bank Observatory. Uh, this is a 100 meter parabolic dish uh, located in West, Virgi West Virginia. Um, and the basic functioning of the, of the dish is uh, it collects um, radio emission in the primary parabolic uh, um, dish, and it gets reflected into uh, focus, which houses the, uh, the antenna uh, uh, and the feed. Um, another uh, very large dish is the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope, which was constructed recently in China and is uh, takes the distinction of the largest um, single um, um, single dish radio telescope uh, in the world. So this is just a couple of examples. Um, but to jump into what are fast radioverse, um, well, they're characterized observationally since we don't yet know exactly what uh, what the true nature of, of FRB sources are. Um, so their nature is characterized, I guess, in the name, they're fast, they're brief bursts of radio waves lasting a few thousandths of a, of a second. Um, the first was detected by Duncan Lormer um, with the Parkes Radio Telescope um, in 2007. And since then, we've collected a large number of FRBs. Uh, and the estimated rate, despite um, it being quite difficult to detect FRBs due to their, um, uh, their shortness, their shortness in the duration, and the fact that we don't know where they will uh, be observed uh, on the sky at a single at a single moment, um, despite these challenges, the, the, the actual detection estimated rate is actually quite high. It's uh, thousands uh, per sky per day. Um, but the origin, as I mentioned, of, of FRBs is still uh, unknown. What we do know at this time is that they're extragalactic and um, and actually, they're they're very extragalactic. They're at uh, um, cosmological distances, um, and so therefore, in order to be observed um, at Earth, must be intrinsically very luminous events. So the reason why I can say that they're uh, very distant um, from us is due to a trademark characteristic of FRBs, which is uh, dispersion. So for those familiar with a dispersion of light, um, back, you know, uh, taking a physics course in high school, you know that if you shine white light through a prism, uh, due to the uh, refractive index of the material of the prism, it will actually uh, bend uh, light uh, by different angles um, determined by the frequency of, of the light. And in that sense, will uh, separate out the light into its constituent wavelengths and be observed as color, as a color gradient uh, from red to blue. And this is obviously um, how we see rainbows, uh, where the dispersive medium in this context is uh, rain droplets or water droplets. Um, so actually, the same sort of dispersive effects uh, can be seen in FRBs and is often the first question uh, of an FRB when it's detected, at least within the CHIME collaboration, is what is its dispersion measure? And the dispersion measure is basically a way to characterize uh, the, um, 
amount of dispersive delay of the FRB. So it's observed in the FRB. So here I'm showing what we often call, refer to as a waterfall plot, which is just showing uh, frequency in the vertical axis and then time in the um, horizontal axis. And you can see that the signal, um, which we see here, uh, sweeps across uh, the band pass of the observation uh, as a function of time. And the signal arrives earlier at higher frequencies and later at uh, lower frequencies. So there's a little cartoon here which kind of demonstrates what that looks like in a way that uh, um, um, is observed in kind of um, a cartoony, uh, a cartoon, cartoony way, I guess, as optical as optical light. But um, what we what we know is that this emission is instantaneous at the source. And the delay that we see observationally is an artifact of its of the signals um, transit through the intervening media. And the amount that uh, the signal is dispersed is directly related to how much material that that signal um, is confronted with. And in particular, um, the relevant material um, in the case of FRBs um, or at radio, radio wavelengths is uh, the amount of free electrons. Um, so the, the DM, which characterizes the dispersive delay, is a uh, direct measure basically of the intervening material and its uh, path through um, um, the distance that it travels through that intervening uh, material. So let me see if I can go to the next slide. So like I said, we can uh, infer basically from the dispersion, the, from the dispersion artifact um, or imprint in the signal that these FRBs are very, very much extragalactic. And that's due to the fact that we uh, have a fairly good handle on what the dispersive contribution would be from our own Milky Way. So, um, you know, space is not, not empty and surely uh, the interstellar medium is, is, is not empty. It's filled with gas and dust. And uh, we would expect some contribution of free electrons um, that reside in our own Milky Way. And if you work out um, the amount, it's actually fairly small, especially for uh, this particular FRB. Um, the maximum DM contribution from our own Milky Way uh, turns out to be estimated as, as uh, 25. Um, the units are not really important here. Uh, the important thing is the huge difference between what we observe in the dispersion and what can be accounted for from our own Milky Way. And what this means is that um, the, um, the missing DM contribution has to, has to come from uh, an extragalactic, uh, has to be extragalactic in nature. And that missing contribution is effectively um, the intervening media of, of of the uh, intergalactic intergalactic medium, um, which is much less dense than what we would see in the interstellar medium, and therefore the distances required to arrive at the observed DM are are huge. And just how huge are those distances? So to put this, I guess, in context, I've I've kind of uh, used this illustration um, and put uh, the scales. Uh, referencing, uh, I guess, distance in, in, in terms of light seconds, light minutes, and light years. So first off, Earth, we're all familiar with, is quite large. Um, the circumference of Earth is about 10% uh, of a light second. Now, if we scale out to uh, the solar system um, to traverse uh, the radius of the solar system, it would be, take about eight light minutes. And then, Similarly, for the Milky Way, it's about 50 uh, light years across. In the case of the FRB, uh, based off of the dispersion measures that we that we observe, um, these these events are, are are occurring billions of light years away from us. They're actually uh, probing a significant, uh, you know, um, uh, a significant fraction of of, of the universe's age. Um, and then so in that sense are really probing um, what we call the cosmic web, which is the collection, uh, how, how, how material uh, 
congregates on the largest scales as galaxy clusters. Um, and because these are occurring at such large distances, FRBs must be extremely bright. So what are FRBs? Like I said, we, we still don't quite know what FRBs are, although uh, I think we are getting closer at converging towards um, some preferred models and at the very least ruling out other models. At one time, there were more um, there were more theories or models for FRBs than there were observations, um, but that thankfully is no longer the case. Um, we're now into the realm of uh, hundreds of FRB observations um, and we'll soon be in um, the regime of, of having thousands to work with. Um, in general, FRB models prefer um, basically sources that are uh, quote unquote compact objects. So what, what do compact objects refer to? Primarily refer to things like neutron stars, which are uh, the dense um, leftovers of, of, of stars that have uh, whose cores have collapsed, um, as well as uh, black holes. Um, and the reason why these, these models are preferred are uh, due to a couple of reasons. One of them is due, just due to the shortness of the emission, the duration being only milliseconds and sometimes microseconds in nature. It requires a very small object to, pr to produce uh, such um, short time scale um, transients. Um, and another reason is just due to um, the fact that the brightness in the radio, um, um, there aren't many models uh, that can explain uh, the luminosity, extreme luminosity of these events in radio that don't um, invoke extremely strong magnetic fields. And we know that these compact objects, primarily black holes, neutron stars, um, um, host extremely strong magnetic fields. So one special example of, of, a, of a FRB host that, um, or of an FRB source that, uh, plausible FRB source uh, is a magnetar, which is a neutron star with an extremely strong magnetic field. So a factor of a thousand stronger than what you would commonly encounter in a, a, um, a more, um, a, 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 a more common, I guess, pulsar, a special type of neutron star, um, and um, millions of billions of times uh, stronger than our Earth's magnetic field. So these are really extreme um, objects. But again, the the uh, the precise nature of the FRB source is still is still uh, unknown. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a kind of brief summary of of what magnetars actually are. I already mentioned. Um, they have extremely strong magnetic fields. Um, the strength of the magnetic fields actually determines the amount of energy that can is available to be dissipated in in the form of radio waves. Um, and there's more than enough energy to to explain the observed uh, luminosities from FRBs. Um, to date, in the Milky Way alone, we have a small sample of of uh, magnetars that have been observed, but these have mostly been observed in at high energy, so in X-rays and gamma rays, and not many are known to to emit in radio at radio wavelengths. And uh, up until recently, uh, none were observed to emit bursts, um, extremely luminous bursts in radio emission uh, at, at radio frequencies. <clears throat> so, a natural question, I guess, is you know, with all these proposed models. Um, it wouldn't be unreasonable to propose that uh, we should attempt to localize where these FRB sources are coming from, and for the maybe to find a preferred, um, you know, galaxies that host these FRBs that might, you know, might indicate which uh, which which models are for FRB emission is viable and which which aren't. The issue with this localization uh, effort is that um, for many um, dishes that operate real-time search uh, pipelines for FRBs, uh, they don't have the necessary resolution to actually pinpoint the galaxy where the FRB uh, came from. So here, this is just showing basically um, the uh, resolution capabilities of the individual beams of different uh, radio telescopes. So the large circle here is the 64 meter uh, Parks radio telescope in Australia. Um, and as you expand the aperture, um, you can actually uh, 
um, increase your resolution capabilities. So naturally, uh, Arecibo, which was functional up until not too, re not too long ago, with this larger aperture, had a smaller uh, uh, uncertainty region in its localization, but still not quite good enough to actually localize an FRB source to its host galaxy. And for that, you really need an inter interferometer, which is a collection of individual radio dishes where you um, um, combine the signals at each of those individual radio dishes in a clever way to enhance your, your re resolving power, basically. And this is showing with a 25 kilometer baseline separations between individual radio dishes of the very, uh, very large array in New Mexico, how small you can get that uncertainty region. Um, but the challenge with that is that um, interferometers really aren't that great for searching um, for FRBs because their field of view is actually very, very small. And so for a source where you don't know where it's going to go off on the sky at a given time or when, um, it's very difficult to localize uh, or to even observe a source with, with, with an interferometer. Thankfully, um, back in 2016, I think, um, we finally observed a repeating FRB source. Um, so this is an important observation because it established that FRBs could, uh, at least some fraction of FRB sources could or were capable of repeating um, and ruled out cataclysmic models um, which would um, predict that you would only get one FRB um, event per, per source. So it was actually a pretty consequential uh, observation. And, 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 and um, I think um, there were lots of additional um, observations um, that were done on the source um, after, after its initial detection. Um, that really pushed the field forward. Um, so this was done with the Arecibo Observatory. Um, and like, as I mentioned before, the localization capabilities of Arecibo aren't sufficient to actually pinpoint where on the sky the FRB went off. However, because it, of its, by virtue of its repeating nature, um, we could observe the source um, with an interferometer and hope that we detected uh, an additional repeat with, with an interferometer and then be able to localize at the required uh, resolution to, to actually um, confidently claim that we've, we've localized the host galaxy of, of the FRB source. And so that was done in 2017, published in, in 2017, uh, done with the VLA. And what's being shown here in this plot is basically the um, beam size of the Arecibo uh, observations. Um, and the lines that are all um, kind of coinciding at a single point uh, is the localization uh, that is enabled with the VLA. Um, and the lines are basically just an artifact of how the dishes are arranged. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's just an artifact of how the dishes are arranged. Um, but they all congregate at a single point, which is the localization of, of the of the source. And so what that allowed is actually uh, the identification of the host galaxy, which is shown here, and uh, optical follow-up um, to characterize the nature of the host galaxy. And what was found is that the FRB source resides in a dwarf galaxy. Um, and subsequent observations at higher frequencies uh, established that the source resides in a highly dense magnetized environment. And that was done with, with polarization studies at, 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 at high frequencies. Um, what this, I think, observation did was uh, definitively um, show that FRBs uh, are at cosmological distances. Because previously, we are arriving at that conclusion from the indirect observation of the dispersion measure. Um, however, with this observation, we were able to actually definitively show that the FRBs are indeed um, extragalactic and, and over cosmological distances, and therefore extremely bright. 
So the state of the field pre-CHIME FRB, which was around 2019, was that um, we had a handful of observations of, of FRBs, um, and we observed at least one that repeated. Um, as I mentioned, that ruled out cataclysmic models for at least for that particular source. It enabled first localization, um, and then subsequent localizations actually followed with dedicated um, surveys that were just coming online at the time. And one of those surveys was the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, which is an interferometer operated up, up, up in, the, in Australia um, and has um, a, basically a detection backend that is tailored to, um, to detecting FRBs. And, and that's important because it actually has a simultaneous capability of having reasonable wide field in order to detect um, um, FRBs going off at unknown uh, times, and um, but also the localization capability to, to pinpoint where they are. Um, and so um, this is just a panel showing those localizations for a sample um, that they detected. And these, what's interesting here is that these are all um, non-repeating events, so one-off uh, events. And so a natural question that arose from, from this was, well, um, are there two populations of, of FRBs? Are there repeating FRBs and non-repeating FRBs? Do they reside in different environments, host galaxies? And at the time, um, we could really only ask the question because we just had too small of a sample. So the path forward for answering this question was basically to collect more observations of, of FRBs and ideally uh, uh, localized FRBs. So that's when uh, CHIME FRB experiment uh, entered, entered the scene, which was around uh, the last half of 2018, I think was when we were going through the commissioning period of the FRB real-time detection pipeline. And then into 2019, I think when we um, started stable operations uh, of, of the experiment. Um, so CHIME is located in Patekton, uh, BC, Canada on the grounds of the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. And the instrument is originally designed for a uh, cosmology experiment. So um, the purpose, I guess, is, is in the name, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. So its original uh, design purpose was to map out um, neutral hydrogen at intermediate um, distances or intermediate redshifts, basically in uh, universe's history to better understand, I guess, um, how um, large scale structure uh, came to be over time. But it was quickly realized in uh, the process of designing the, the experiment that this would be make an, actually make an excellent um, instrument to run an FRB search, real time search pipeline uh, on. Um, and in fact, we operate the dish uh, 24 seven, um, searching for FRBs. And the way that it works is uh, basically we let the sky transit over us. So there's no move, moving parts in this, um, in this telescope. Uh, we let Earth rotation move the sky uh, for us. Um, and the data rate uh, for this is, is, is pretty enormous. So you can imagine searching for FRBs with a data rate of 13 terabytes per second is a pretty daunting, uh, daunting task. So how do we go about doing the actual search? So CHIME is a interferometer. Um, so what that means is that there's multiple uh, antennas um, within the structure. And those, uh, the signal from each of those uh, feeds, those, those antennas can be, um, can be, um, added uh, in a clever way, such that we can form individual beams, localized regions of, of high sensitivity along arbitrary directions on the sky. Um, and in fact, uh, I shouldn't say that in arbitrary directions, it's a tied grid of basically of beams. Um, just how many beams? 1,024 beams. Um, so it's, the beam, I guess the beams are oriented such that there's 256 beams along the north-south direction and four beams along the east-west 
direction. And what that gives us is a huge field of view, which this um, illustration is trying to capture. Uh, 120 degrees north-south direction, uh, 2.5 to 1 degrees in the east-west direction, depending on your frequency that you're observing. And that field of view is key for um, observing FRBs um, because, again, the location in the sky is unknown. So this is just a video just showing uh, you know, uh, walking through how the Trend Telescope functions. It stares at Zenith, basically, and just maps out the northern hemisphere within a single side real day. And the, the FRB pipe, uh, search pipeline um, operates um, on the intensity stream that comes from uh, those 1,024 uh, beams. Um, so this is showing, basically, the footprint of that a field of view. And as it transits through the sky, we get lucky occasionally and detect an FRB as it goes off. So that's what makes, oh. So that was, that, that's what makes um, Chime FRB uniquely um, powerful instrument for detecting FRBs is uh, effectively their large field of view and their reasonable sensitivity. So what does this look like in the real-time system? Um, thankfully, most of the real-time system is now automated. So um, there isn't required, um, it, it doesn't require a high degree of manual interfacing with, with the observer. Um, but we do have regular monitoring schedules just to make sure that the real-time pipeline is, um, is uh, functioning nominally. Um, and what I've kind of screen, screen grabbed here is uh, what this looks like uh, from one of the diagnostic tools that we use to keep track of the real-time system. I guess one of, the, one of the things I want to highlight, I don't know if I can show my cursor here, is on the right-hand side, um, this is documenting um, the number of events uh, by classification over an hour period. And what you can see is we can have classifications by known sources, extragalactic events, which is what we're concerned with with FRBs, galactic events, which are uh, pulsars, um, RFI events, um, which is quite large. Um, these can get into several thousands. In fact, when the RFI environment is really bad, it can be hundreds of thousands of events within, within an hour. And all of this needs to happen in real time in order for us to get uh, data, um, to write out data for what we think are FRB detections as they go off on sky. So this needs to work seamlessly um, in, in real time. Um, so in mid-2018, while we were going through a commissioning period of the instrument, uh, we found our first FRB. And this is just a screen grab of looking back at the history of, of uh, events. Uh, we have a channel dedicated on Slack, if those, those familiar with, with Slack, which is a platform used by um, used to uh, communicate across uh, across um, across teams, um, we have a, a, a channel dedicated basically to FRB detections uh, and discussing results. And so this was one of the first postings in in that channel, showing our first detection of an FRB back in July to 20, 25th of July uh, two thousand eighteen, and um, obviously, there was lots of very, very excited people, um, lots of exuberance at the detection. And this is actually not unusual on a monthly basis. I think we, we often detect uh, events that are interesting enough that it warrants uh, lots of people getting online and, and reacting. Um, that's one of the pleasures of, of being in a large collaboration is just enjoying um, enjoying the excitement of discovery with, with a group of people. So the status of the field uh, um, back in 2019 before Chime came online was uh, is captured in this, um, in this graphic here, which just shows the number of FRBs as a function of, of year. And so the Lorimer burst was observed, you know, reported in 2007, but it was actually detected. It was archival data that they were searching through. And so the actual event went off in 2001. So that's why you see uh, a spike here. Um, 
And um, you can see that there's uh, several surveys that were operated off of uh, different radio telescopes, the Green Bank Telescope, Arecibo, uh, Utmost, um, which is Australian, uh, ASCAP Australian again. Chime at that time didn't have any detections. And then when Chime turned on, uh, the field changed drastically. Uh, we effectively expanded the sample from tens to, 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 to hundreds um, in, in a couple of years. And uh, although it's not shown here, we continue to operate at a, a, a cadence, I guess, of um, one to three detections per day. So you can just uh, fill in basically the last, uh, the last uh, four years or so with uh, a comparable level of detections. So we put out our first time FRB catalog, uh, not too long, it feels like it wasn't too long ago, but it probably um, was a year or so ago, um, documenting the first um, five, over 500, maybe 550 FRB detections with the Chime FRB instrument. And this is just showing uh, those detections um, in galactic coordinates um, relative to other uh, detections from other uh, surveys. And you can see clearly that Chime sample dominates and the unusual distribution in galactic coordinates is just due to the fact that Chime is not sensitive in the Southern hemisphere, um, obviously due to uh, the limitations uh, of operating in, in Canada. Um, and so, uh, in actuality, the, the, the exposure of Chime is, is, is not uniform even across the field of view. Um, and that's just due to the fact that um, the exposure, the exposures uh, towards the North Pole can actually be quite large. Um, so this cluster of detections actually corresponds to uh, FRBs detected towards the, the, uh, um, the North Pole. There's my half hour uh, warning. Um, so that was the FRB catalog as, uh, as, a, as a sky map in lab coordinates. Um, we also provided uh, corresponding waterfall plots for each of those 550 or so events. Uh, again, the waterfall plot being uh, usually how we classify FRBs as truly FRBs and not, uh, not something else, um, showing uh, the emission as a function of frequency and time. Um, and here you'll see that uh, uh, we've gotten rid of the dispersive imprint uh, by basically correcting for for the dispersion and showing the FRB as it would look at the source it's, uh, at the source itself. Um, so it's, it's in instantaneous emission across across the bandwidth um, uh, of the of the source. And what can be done with this is uh, we can, whereas before we were limited basically to special events, we can now do uh, interesting statistical study of the FRB properties. Um, we can look at things like the dispersion measure distribution. Um, we can look at other properties, which I won't get into, um, and how they correlate with each other. Uh, you can also look at differences in the repeating and non-repeating uh, sample. Uh, this large sample also gives us uh, lots of unique sources uh, as well. Um, so one way that we can uh, look at this in a statistical way is characterize the FRBs um, detected uh, uh, and particularly look at the, the bandwidth of the emission or the, or the burst durations. And what was found um, by a colleague of mine, um, Diggy Plunis, who's now at University of Toronto, is that there's meaningful differences between uh, the burst bandwidths and uh, duration of repeating and non-repeating FRB sources. So here, this is just showing a, uh, I guess, archetypes of uh, four different archetypes of, of, of types of FRB emission. Um, and in general, FRBs that are uh, broadband and quite narrow in time are more likely not to be observed to repeat. Whereas uh, FRBs that have uh, lots of structure in their emission and are quite, uh, long in duration, their burst envelope is, is significantly larger, are more likely to be observed to repeat. So that bodes the natural question, uh, do all FRBs, FRBs repeat or are they different, uh, different populations and different, possibly 
entirely different um, different sources for 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 the emission. And this is just a uh, an additional, I guess, plot showing a statistical study of what I was just mentioning: the bandwidth and duration for one off uh, and repeater bursts. And you can see that they occupy very different parts of that of that phase space. <laughs> So I mentioned that such a large sample gave us, um, uh, obviously it enabled statistical study of the population, but it also gave us some unusual events that were interesting in their own right to study. And one of those events was the second detected repeater, um, FRB 2018-09-16B um, is the name that was, that was given to it. Um, and what was interesting about this source um, was uh, that it was established that not only does it repeat, but it that repeats at irregular intervals of 16 days um, with a kind of four day buffer region around that 16 day period. And so um, what this top um, what this top uh, panel basically is showing is the detections in red as a function of time um, over quite a large you know, uh, time span, multi year time span um, relative to the exposure time. Um, which is shown as these, as these black dots. Now these, the vertical gray region is basically the activity phase uh, of, that was determined for, for this FRB source. And you can see that the detections regularly occur within that activity phase. Um, so we're extremely confident um, in uh, the detection of the 16 day period and subsequent observations have established um, with, with other instruments, with other um, surveys have established uh, a similar result. Um, and I think really have motivated um, a whole subfield, which is dedicated to running um, search pipelines that look for periodicity and repeating sources. Um, but to date, this is the sole source that has a robust uh, 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 you know, measurement on, on its periodicity. Another extremely interesting source that uh, was detected by Chime FRB was the first uh, galactic FRB. And this was found to uh, originate from a magnetar. Um, and this is the waterfall plot showing uh, the double burst of, of this FRB. Um, it was extremely bright, as you can imagine, if it's uh, doesn't, uh, it's not, uh, if it's galactic, it's much closer and therefore we would observe it as a, as a much brighter event. Um, in fact, this was observed in what is referred to as a side lobe of, of time. So it wasn't observed on Zenith where the sensitivity is maximal. It was actually observed way, 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 way off of Zenith where the sensitivity is a small fraction of what, of, of, of what, uh, of what it is at Zenith. And yet we still observed it as an incredibly bright event. Um, and in addition to that, um, it was found to be correlated in time with um, um, uh, observations of, of, of X-ray uh, emission as well. Um, so this observation, I think, really established uh, magnetars as the preferred model. Um, but there are still questions surrounding on whether or not magnetars could explain all FRBs, given the fact that FRBs are actually fairly common events and whether or not there's actually enough magnetars in the universe that are ca capable of um, providing the, 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 um, the numbers that we observe. Um, but what we did establish here, I think, is that this is indeed a FRB-like burst from a galactic source. So at the very least, magnetars can explain uh, some fraction of the population of the FRB population. And that's a pretty important observation. So the, the, the plot that I'm showing here um, is a bit technical, but it's showing basically uh, the distance uh, of sources, of different sources. And this is on a logarithmic scale. So each increment is a factor of 10. Um, and the observed brightness of basically of, of the source. So at the left, corner here, we see a, the galactic pulsar sample, which are galactics and so for, therefore are, are relatively you know, nearby on cosmological scales at least. And at the rightmost extent in the corner here, the lower corner, are 
all the FRB detections up to that, uh, localized FRB detections up to that point. <clears throat> and what's being shown in the, in the um, diagonal lines basically is the intrinsic luminosity. And so the important thing here is that FRBs are extremely bright relative to um, more common and boring, you know, galactic pulsar. Um, and then in the top corner here is the SGR 1935, which is the magnetar uh, detection. Um, and so you can see that it is obviously much closer because it's, it's a galactic source, but it's observed to be extremely bright. But even with that, um, you know, even with uh, observing it to be extremely bright, it's still, um, you know, several orders of magnitude, so maybe a, a thousand times less bright intrinsically than FRBs that we detect. And even some of the most distant ones have to be incredibly uh, energetic events in order to be detected at, at, at Earth. Um, so this observation definitely filled the Fills, fills the gap, does an important role of filling the gap, but there's still more questions about whether or not magnetars can actually explain the entire FRB population. And to add, I guess, further credence to that skepticism was uh, an observation of an FRB, which was later found to repeat in a nearby uh, galaxy, M81. And I think still to this day, this is the, the nearest extragalactic, um, extragalactic uh, FRB that was observed. Um, and what was interesting about this source is that because it was so near, um, CHIME was able to get a preliminary, uh, in a preliminary way, I guess, localize it to, to M81, despite it having um, not the best localization capabilities. But because it repeats, we were able to observe it in subsequent bursts with the Euro European VLBI network, which is an instrument that gives us um, the most precise possible localization that you could hope for. Um, um, and what we found uh, was that actually this source resides in a globular cluster. And the reason why that's interesting is because we wouldn't expect magnetars to reside in globular clusters because globular clusters are uh, very old objects, um, billions, billions of years old. Magnetars tend to prefer environments that are star forming environments um, and relatively young stellar populations. So this really, this observation really challenges the notion that all magnetars can explain, um, uh, the magnetars can explain all FRBs. So the, the path that I, I mentioned that, that CHIME has limited localization capability. I think the path that the field is, is heading towards is, um, focusing efforts on improving our localization capabilities. And this is across surveys, both within CHIME and, and even outside of CHIME. Um, and the reason why this is important is because so much information is carried in um, the localization of a host galaxy. Um, it enables um, a determination of distance that is independent of the DMF measurement, the dispersion. But it also enables subsequent follow-up analysis um, that can look at, um, you know, uh, multi, you know, multi-wavelength analysis that can characterize the nature of the host galaxies and compare that to what's predicted from models. So this is just showing basically what our current capability is um, with our current precision, our best, our best possible precision that we can hope for, which is arc many localization capability, and just how many plausible candidate host galaxies or could be contained within that, that localization precision. But going forward, um, a lot of effort is being is dedicated, right now at least, to commissioning uh, the extension basically of the Chime FRB experiment, which is this outriggers project, which I confess I didn't know what an outrigger was and I had to look it up, but it's these uh, kind of extensions out of a boat that stabilize. Um, they really do actually look like uh, similar to to a cylinder uh, used for for time, but in any case, uh, the project basically operates by uh, constructing um, sister dishes separated by phys you know but large physical distances, um, and so uh, the project is designed to construct uh, outrigger station 
at three sites. Um, one of those sites is located relatively close to the main Chai Mavra B site, which is only 100 kilometers away. Um, and uh, two others are located in, in the United States, one at the Green Bank Observatory and another at, in, in California uh, at Hat Creek uh, Radio Observatory. And um, what this does is the physical separations actually give you uh, incredible enhanced resolving capability um, because you become much more sensitive to small changes in direction on the sky when you have these large separations in baseline. And so what we in practice will be capable of doing is localizing um, an FRB host galaxy. And this can be done in principle just with the time FRB uh, and KKO baseline of only 100 kilometers. We'll already be operating in a domain where we can pinpoint the host galaxy of any FRB that we observe um, well, out to reasonable distances, at least. But in the future, um, we'll actually be able to do even better once we get the outrigger sites, the full array, basically. Once we construct um, the outrigger sites located in, in the United States, we'll have the necessary baseline to actually pinpoint the location within the galaxy, um, which is actually quite important because um, the properties of the local environment can differ significantly from the global properties of, of the host galaxy itself. So you can get a very, very different picture depending on whether or not you aggregate the, the, you know, the host galaxy properties or have information about the, the local environment itself. So the status of this project is that um, we're still in a commissioning phase, phase but um, construction and the installation of the analog and the digital systems uh, is complete at KKO and at GBO. Um, and that we anticipate that the full array will come online hopefully sometime in the summer of 2024. And we're excited ab about this because it'll enable, as I mentioned, multi wavelength follow up to characterize host galaxies and even possibly local environments. And we can do this on, in principle, any FRB that we detect with the Chime FRB uh, system. So this will be, in principle, we could localize every single FRB that we detect. Um, so that'll be thousands over the next over the next years. So the only limiting factor in running that analysis is basically manpower of uh, how many people are available to run the follow-up analysis that's required for, for uh, host galaxy localization. So where can uh, you get involved? I guess there's a couple of different ways if you're interested in kind of exploring this topic more um, in the context of Chime FRB at least. Um, one really interesting way, which I think um, a few of you might be um, keen to, to explore, is a Zooniverse project. So this is like a citizen science project where the Chime FRB um, experiment um, regularly posts uh, plausible candidates of FRBs that we're not quite sure about, that we kind of outsource the classification to, um, to um, non-Chime members, basically. Um, so you can navigate to Zooniverse, and uh, the name of the project is Burst from Space. And this is just an example, basically, of uh, an event that um, doesn't quite meet the criteria required um, within the Chime FRB collaboration, but that we um, still consider to be an interesting candidate that is worth, uh, um, you know, separating out and do its own its own additional sample. Uh, and so the job of these members of these volunteers is basically to classify whether or not this is actually astrophysical or if it's, um, you know, uh, terrestrial or uh, radio frequency interference. Um, so there's lots of, you know, the, the 70,000 candidates uh, you can join over 5,000 uh, or 5,000 volunteers uh, looking at that sample if you're interested. Uh, the other way for the people that are super keen maybe in this audience, which may be one or two, um, you can get regular uh, a regular feed, basically a, a um, daily email that updates um, on detections made um, um, from the previous day. And this is just offers uh, just, um, um, I guess, uh, information, general information about the FRB detection, like its uh, location on the sky, its dispersion measure. Um, 
uh, and in principle is, is designed for, um, so the VO events, virtual observatory events service is designed for collaboration across, across different, um, across different uh, wavelengths, observing different wavelengths and different instruments. Uh, but in principle for an inter you know, interested ast amateur astronomer, they can also, uh, there's nothing stopping them from, from signing up as well and getting daily updates from, from Chum at Um I'll end it there. I'm not sure how over time I went and I'll take any questions. Well, fascinating sub uh, subject. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, especially as visual observers or astrophotographers in the crowd here. It's uh, definitely a fascinating subject. <laughs> I'll get, get us kick uh, started with, uh, and maybe you have covered this one, how many FRBs have been detected to date? Uh, and how do we distinguish natural phenomena from artificial sources or from art sources? Yeah, so the official the official uh, number of the number of detections is from Chime is uh, around 550 events, and then with the inclusion of events detected by other surveys, that comes up to around 700 and some odd events. But unofficially, um, we Chime FRB just surpassed I think 4,000 uh, FRB detections. Um, and that information is freely available actually through the VO, the, this virtual observatory uh, service. Um, um, so yeah, we have a large, we're now going from hundreds to thousands of, of our resources. Uh, and the other question was, how do you disentangle, I guess, astro, uh, astrophysical origins from terrestrial origins for our, for, for candidates, I guess. And, and that is, that's a good question and, and something that, um, we're constantly improving on. Um, one of the duties, I, want, I guess, one of the, the hats I wear within the Chime FRB project is that I'm a, uh, with, with what's called the run coordinator, which is I basically manage uh, the monitoring, the weekly monitoring on a week to week basis. Um, teams that are dedicated to um, monitoring the operations, but also the classification of, of events. Um, and so RFI in general, tends to be narrow band. And that's one way that we can, um, we can, well, maybe one way to illustrate this is to go back to the Lorimer burst. So yeah, this is the Lorimer burst. Um, so our, so this band here, this horizontal band is, is RFI. Uh, in general, yeah, human-made radio signal tends to be very, very narrow band. And astrophysical signal could be easily spotted if it's, if it's broadband enough um, and, and bright enough. So that's that's one rule of thumb, I guess. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, okay. Awesome. Um, audience, please feel free to add questions. I'll go to the next one. Uh, how do we? This is from Keith. How do we make sense of very brief events? M seconds, I think it was milliseconds. Uh, with extremely high luminosity that are detected by the emission of radio waves, low energy, where is most of the energy and can we see it in theory? Okay, sorry, could you say that question one more time? Okay. Yeah, I think maybe Keith, you're on. So if you want to maybe take that one. Yeah, I will unmute. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask the question. Uh, it just struck me as strange because these seem to be extremely high energy events. You've mentioned because of the size of the pulse, they must come from a very focal point. And yet we're detecting radio waves, which are the lowest energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. It would seem that, you know, X-rays make sense. Gamma rays make sense. Radio waves don't seem to make sense to me as a non-physicist. Is there other energy and other spectra that we're just not seeing? Where is all that energy? Right. Um, yeah, that, that's that's a great question. So, I guess um, what I would say to that is um, that in general, um, I think we get a lot of, uh, we get a lot of. Um, I, I guess what I'm what I want to say is that we're informed by what we observe from radio pulsars, and in the case of radio pulsars, we know that uh, there can be some fairly bright radio pulsars that are detectable um, as single pulses. Normally you have to fold the pulse by its period 
in order to, for the emission to be detectable above the noise. Um, but there's fairly bright radio pulses that are detectable as single pulses, not as bright as FRBs, um, but where no optical or any higher energy emission is observed. And that's an artifact, I think, of the distinct emission process that's responsible for pulsar emission uh, and what is uh, uh, that is distinct from um, you know, emission that you would encounter at, 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 at um, high energies like X-rays or gamma rays. So it's maybe it's not necessarily true that that the fact that FRB signals are so incredibly bright at radio frequencies that it would uh, that would require that um, it also be equivalently bright at, at high energies as well. Um, but that's but that that's also a great point. And one actual subfield I think of FRBs is looking at um, multi wavelength counterparts that are prompt uh, that are really probing prompt emission. So having the capability of detecting the FRB, but also quickly looking for any associated multi-wavelength counterpart, whether that be optical or X-ray emission. Um, so that, yeah, that's an area of, of like active exploration right now. Yeah. Keith, while you have the floor, do you want to ask your next one too around the blue stragglers? Sure, as we go back to verbal. Um, I was intrigued by what you had mentioned about picking up some of these fast radio bursts in globular clusters, again, because globular clusters largely contain very old stars. And these phenomena seem to be associated with much younger stellar populations. So I know that there are things called blue stragglers in clusters. There's the notion that they may be a product of uh, two stars merging. Uh, and, and in that regard, and they're very, very hot. And, and to some extent, almost mimic a younger star population. So I guess I was wondering if if the existence of blue stragglers may be part of the answer or an aspect of the answer of how you could manage to pick up FRBs in a globular cluster. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not sure what, yeah, I'm really not sure what to say there. Um, I think, <laughs> I think, I, I think the, the observation of, of this M81 FRB in a globular cluster doesn't entirely rule out uh, magnetar origins. It definitely challenges magnetar origins. And there's recently been papers that have tried to come up with scenarios where you could create a magnetar out of evolved um, recycled, basically what we call recycled pulsars, so old kind of evolved um, pulsars. Um, and reinvigorate the magnetic field in through a merger process between between two um, two pulsars um, or two uh, two white dwarfs actually uh, sorry um, so the merger process of two white dwarfs um, create a magnetar through a, a different channel than what we would normally encounter which is uh, the creation of magnetars through large um, young um, young stars that aren't aren't often encountered in globular clusters. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm really not familiar with this blue straggler, um, these blue straggler types of objects. Um, yeah. All right, we'll go to the next one. This next one's from Rob. Is it possible for a short burst to hide in a long burst? And do any SRBs come from the Milky Way? So I'm assuming that short radio bursts come from the Milky Way. Yeah, so I'll answer his last question first, which is, uh, do any, um, so it was, sorry, it was, do any FRBs come from the Milky Way? Uh, was, SRBs, so short radio bursts. Oh, short, short radio bursts. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what short radio bursts. I um, I'm not probably meant FRB, probably bursts. mistyped it. Oh, okay. All right. All right, so let's say it's FRBs then. It's a yeah, yeah. Typo. right. So, so well, for 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 FRBs, we do know that at least one we've detected one FRB-like uh, event from the our own Milky Way, which is this magnetar SGR 1935-2154. And um, I guess the, the the question is whether or not um, all magnetars, uh, or whether or not magnetars describe all FRBs, and that's something that 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 we we can't we can't know yet for certain. Uh, but it's looking based off of 
uh, localization information of, of the FRB, current FRB sample, that it's pretty hard to um, explain the diversity of the host galaxies and the local environments of these FRBs through one uh, progenitor channel, one, one, one FRB source, uh, i.e. magnetar. Um, so it's looking, the evidence is pointing to the possibility that there's multiple channels for FRB, uh, creating FRB sources. Um, I, sorry, the, his first question was an actually an interesting, interesting one about uh, is it possible for a short, uh, an even Gross. shorter FRB to be buried in a longer FRB? Yeah, I think was kind of the question, and yeah. that's a great question actually. Um, our, the, it kind of speaks to the sensitivity of the Chime FRB instrument, which is designed to basically, it's optimized to detect FRBs at millisecond time scale. But there's nothing saying that you can't get an FRB at much, much shorter time scales or longer time scales for that matter. But well, for, for shorter time scales, actually, we've observed microstructure in individual bursts where we can go down to nanosecond time scales and we can see structure. And that's really interesting because it puts really stringent constraints on the uh, physical scale of the emission region itself. Um, it, it has to be an, coming from an incredibly contained region of space, the, the, the FRB mission itself, to describe net nanosecond uh, variability. So that, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next one's from Randy. Are you still using video cards for the acquisition and analysis? I recall there being a shortage years ago. So the video cards, are you still using video cards? So we're, we're using GPU. Yeah, we are using gra gra processing units um, to early on, basically. Um, so this is not to hardware of the Chime FRB experiment, but is hardware of the Chime experiment itself um, and is responsible for um, the important stage, basically, of beam forming, of forming these 1,024 beams. Uh, which is very, very computationally intensive to do over the short time scales required to do it. Um, you need to do this over, you know, uh, millisecond time scales uh, form these these uh, these individual 1,024 beams. Um, so we are using GPUs in in that stage of the the processing, the the digital backend of of the uh, experiment. It's fascinating indeed, uh, for sure. Um, next one is from Ron. I was hoping to hear about your polarization work. What might that reveal? Polarization. Yeah. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, I, I didn't have time to put together a slide. But polarization, I think, is a field of study that is uh, historically, I think, was underappreciated up until fairly recently. But there's been a lot of really interesting work done in the past few years. Um, and I think what it's shown is that FRB sources reside, uh, repeating sources in particular, reside in really dynamic uh, environments that are um, very um, um, constantly changing, uh, if you put it, put it that way. And we, we know this based off of observations of variations in, in propagation of effects that are introduced from the intervening media that can only be explained by changes in like the, the, the very immediate surroundings of the FRB source. Um, um, so I think, I think there, there will always be a, a place for polarization studies, even in the age of ultra precise localizations, because with polarization, you can really uh, characterize the immediate surroundings of the of the source that are inaccessible even at you know very 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 you know precise localization um so yeah that's uh i continue to work in, in, that, in that area um and it'll be obviously very interesting to do a full statistical study of the flores properties of frbs with with hundreds to thousands of frb sources and that's something that we're actually actively working on right now is putting together a catalog of, of that Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Larissa. Uh, please explain the units of burst rate, 1,000 second per sky per day. Yeah, so that is basically uh, an inferred measurement based off of um, 
the exposure of a, I forget where I put it, but it's probably not important. Um, but it's, yeah, it's basically, um, it's an inferred measurement based off of how many FRBs we detected. Um, and considering the exposure of our, of our, of our instrument uh, as well. Um, so although CHIME has one of the largest field of views of any FRB operating FRB survey, uh, it's still a small, small fraction of the sky that we're sensitive to at any given moment. And we detect FRBs at a, at a rate of only, uh, I say only, but a few per day um, with that relatively small you know, slit of the sky. Um, so it stands to reason that uh, you know, FRBs have to be fairly common if we're detecting a few per day with that small field of view that covers a fraction of the sky. Um, the, the number of FRBs that go off in a single day has to be on the order of, you know, a much, much larger value. So that's how, um, in words, I guess, how we arrive at that thousand estimate of FRBs. All right. Uh, this is a question from Randy. I'm not sure which, uh, picture he was referring to. Is that a Johnny on the spot for scale in the chime picture? I... I'm not sure what that means, but I hope you know what that means there. Yeah. Is that a Johnny on the spot for scale? Keep going back. Okay. Uh, the, the final slide? Uh, no, no, no. Er, early slide. It was an early, early slide. Oh, that, that gives scale as well. Yeah, that gives scale as well. It's the first there. picture showing, no, no, way back, but that's that gives scale as well. It, yeah. There, there wasn't much to give scale in the picture other than a little blue, uh, I believe, drawing on the spot. Uh, there. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Uh, I did not see that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, measurement that's often thrown around in the collaboration is that the size of the combined, you know, four cylinders, is uh, the size of five hockey rings. Ah, a true Canadian measurement. That's good. Yeah. Um, just a couple more questions uh, from Vanessa. Can you explain the DM equations that you had in the beginning? Um, where are these DM equations? I think that might have been the 25 and 375, I believe. Oh, yeah. That, that yeah. Were the, you, I, oh, yeah. Okay. Is this, yeah. I hope this is the one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I guess first off, um, so what's being shown here basically is uh, the time delay. So T1 and T2 are two different frequencies. So that's the difference in time of the arrival of the signal. Um, and that scales by the dispersion measure, which is a measure of the integrated amount of um, free electrons here and over the, over the path length. So we call this the column depth. It's like uh, if you took a fly swatter and uh, ran the entire distance that the FRB signal transited, how many, how many free electrons would you sweep up in that flies water? Um, and um, the time delay scales as a function of inverse frequency squared. Uh, so it really, it, it, it traces out a, a parabolic shape. It's not, it's not linear, it's, it's a parabolic kind of shape as a function of, uh, of frequency. Um, and so, the, yeah, the reason why this is interesting and important, I guess, is just that you can um, get a measurement of the intervening medium uh, between you and the source based off of this observation of this dispersive delay. And that's actually super interesting for effort. We, we use it actually this dispersive delay feature in um, studies at the interstellar medium um, by observing uh, pulsars, galactic pulsars, but you can apply a similar sort of uh, study to FRBs where not only are you where you're actually studying um, the uh, extragalactic medium or the intergalactic medium, and really um, uh, the clustering of, of medium on the larger scales. Um, so, so that's that's kind of the the promise of FRBs is that they can be used effectively as probes of the intervening medium in a way that's similar to how galactic pulsars are used to probe the interstellar medium. I don't know if that was helpful. 
Yeah, absolutely. I hope, so. Vanessa, if you have any follow-up questions, do post it. In the meantime, I'll go to the next one. Uh, Randy asked, does Chime operate more or less 24-7? Yes, yeah, so it, it does, um, although there are always um, fires to be put out. Um, and so it's not uncommon for um, us to pause operations for for days or weeks, uh, uh, um, God forbid. Um, but yes, in the summer, we actually have to do regularly do thermal, basically thermal shutdowns of the system um, in the afternoons because um, the uh, the digital backend basically gets just too hot to operate safely. Um, so there are there's downtime for sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back, and this is a question for me now, I'm going to go back to Contact, one of my favorite uh, growing up, favorite books growing up. Um, do you look, do you work with SETI? Uh, no, no, yeah, so Chime FRB doesn't, doesn't work with SETI, but uh, I have at least one colleague who after her time, she was a postdoc, postdoc at Toronto, she uh, got a position working uh, with SETI. Um, and actually, my understanding is that she continued to work um, in her area of interest, which was uh, pulsar radio transient science, so pulsars and, and FRBs. Um, so it, it seems like SETI, uh, in addition to doing their their you know search for extra, extra, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, they also do um, scientific uh, studies as well. Um, so yeah, we don't we don't have any uh, agreement or collaboration currently the time uh, experiment with with SETI. Um, no, it would be interesting to explore for sure. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, if uh, those are the questions we have, Alan and Ryan on the chat, there doesn't seem to be any more. Um, so with that, I thank uh, Dr. McKinnon for spending the time with us. Truly fascinating uh, topic. Like I said, especially for us visual astronomers as well as astrophotographers who are who are uh, in the audience today. With that, I will pass it back to Alan. Uh, yeah, there was actually one more that came in from Vanessa. Um, how do you know they're not signs of extraterrestrial intelligence? And and their messages that you just haven't figured out yet. No, I I added that last little bit. Um, so um, she's asking basically. Um, well. I'll leave the question, I'll let the question stand as it is. Uh, yeah, I suppose it is, it is possible. It's possible that a fraction of, of FRBs are, are, you know, extraterrestrial signatures of, of intelligence. Um, but we do know, going back to the magnetar, we do know for certain that that, uh, that, that source is, is a magnetar, right? Um, so there's an astrophysical explanation. So um, I would say the simplest explanation is usually the right right one. And we don't at this time need to um, invoke uh, aliens as, as the explanation, but uh, it would be definitely a game changer if we could establish that for sure. And if you did get a signal, you would tell SETI about it, right? Of course. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I will go on to... Um, uh, uh, just some wrap up uh, notes about uh, future meetings. Uh, I have already told you about the uh, RAC national um, meeting over the weekend. Please attend so that you can vote for Randy so that uh, he can make sure that uh, things don't go off the rails again. And uh, uh, Riverwood, assuming the weather's gonna be lovely, um, it would be great to have some people at the telescope. So if you can send in your uh, volunteer notices, that would be excellent. Um, our next two meetings are, we have a potpourri on July 21st at UTM. Uh, it'll almost certainly be a uh, merge meeting where we have some people in attendance and some people on Zoom, or worst case scenario, we will at very least record the meeting and post it on YouTube afterwards. And uh, July 25th, following our June um, Riverwood, the July 25th uh, is our next Riverwood. So if you want to get on to Riverwood's website and register first, uh, then you don't have to pay your five bucks per person. That'd be very nice. And I do want to one little shout out because John mentioned it in the email. Uh, Starfest 
August 17th to the 20th. Uh, we do have a large contingent that normally shows up. So uh, uh, be great to um, contact John to register for, uh, so that he knows you're coming. And um, we're getting a lot of uh, thanks to Ryan's in. That was, a, that was a really good talk, Ryan. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we can wrap it up for the, for the night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thank you.